and things like that. But you be here and be part of that, and we'll have a good time. And if you're really good at volleyball, make sure you come and be on my team, right? And if you're bad, you can go to Texas. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry, Texas. But uh, really excited about what God's doing here in the church. We are able now to write the check to pay off the rest of our debt here. We are debt free. Give the Lord a hand.
believing and trusting you for our future, God. The best is not behind us. The best is still to come. And God, I pray you would move powerfully, God, in our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated, kids. You can be dismissed.
the water's going to turn to blood, and then frogs, and then locusts, and then flies, and then all these different things just keep happening, and it would be miserable. Can you imagine going to get in your bed and there being like 10 frogs in your bed? I know I have to one die. She hates that. Or, or, or just so many flies. Have you ever been somewhere where there was just a lot of flies? And they're biting you, or they were just a nuisance. They're all over your food. They're, and you're looking at them, and it's like nasty. It's so filthy. Imagine all these flies. It says that the dust turned to, to flies, basically, that, that it became like that. And God just released them, and it's just miserable for everybody. Well, everybody except the Israelites. And then he put darkness on the whole land. What I love about that, it said it, he, he dropped darkness on the land uh, for Egypt, and it was completely dark. Like, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. But where the Israelites lived right outside, it was like perfect day. There had to have been a, a, a wall, like... This is daylight, and, and God just cut it off and said, no, the darkness over here, complete darkness. And he brings them out through that. And this goes on and on and on and on. And finally, he does, the Passover comes, and he kills all of their firstborn sons. Can you imagine that you go to bed, and the next morning, everybody that you know in Egypt's firstborn sons did. Can you imagine the wailing that's coming up out of Egypt for their children? And finally, he says, okay, they can go get them out of here. He just panics and he sends them off. And so he sends them, he, you know, he brings them away from slavery of Egypt. And Pharaoh decides he wants them back and chases them to the Red Sea. So they get to the Red Sea and they're like, well, what do we do now? And they put their feet in the water and the water jumps up and splits. And they go walking across dry land. So here the Israelites have seen them. And let me tell you, it doesn't say that they walked across mud. It says they walked about completely dry land. Now, I don't know if any of you are into chemistry, but the chemistry behind this kind of blows my mind because it means that God would have had to pull the molecules out of the earth. He's down on a molecular level. He's pulling all of it. So it's literally like a dust path. If, if I went outside and I blocked up the river, we used to block up this creek where I went to camp, you could block up the water, but you couldn't get rid of the mud. And so God is pulling things in completion so much that he pulls the very molecules of water out of the dust and they walk across on dry land. And the Israelites have watched this. God has parted the way for them, causing the water to come crashing down on the head of all those who had enslaved them. And you know, if you've been beaten down in slavery and you've been covered up and there's a guy that's been beating you, when that water came crashing down, there had to be a little bit of their heart that just was like, yes. No. When your enemies are defeated, when the people who mocked you, when the people who belittled you, when they're beaten, it had to be a moment where you're like, this is a good day. You look at your friend, you're high-fiving him, you're looking at all of their horses floating down the street. You have to be fired up about it. And so the people who beat them, the people who enslaved them, and not to mention the ones who had forgotten what Joseph had done for them as rulers years before, now lay dead at the bottom of the sea. The shackles, the chains, and all the beatings that the Israelites had received have been removed. And now they are headed for the promised land. Yeah, you'd think it'd be like party time, man. You'd be up and that. Can you believe where we're we heading? This would be so great. God says it's a land full of milk and honey. But you know what? When the journey got tough, things changed. And it happened very quickly, too. Like, if you read this in the Bible, it seems really quick. Some bipolar folks flipping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They can't figure out what's going on. Here we go. Uh, there we go. Exodus 15. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. So they just left the Red Sea. They just seen the miracle of God. And they went into the desert of Shur for three days as they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. In other words, it was poisonous. That's why it's called uh, Merah. So the people grumbled against Moses. Now, Moses has just brought them out of slavery. You think you could give him a little bit of a break? You know what? It's like you get a pass. Like if somebody paid my lot bill last month, I probably wouldn't complain this month if they didn't pay my water bill. You know what I'm saying? You get a pass. You just got something to for me. I just come out of slavery. But they grumbled against him. And it says, then Moses cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. And he threw it into the water. And the water. 
us that he will spare them from the diseases of Egypt. The only thing he wants in return is obedience. And I've said this a bunch of times, but I'll say it again. Obedience is entry-level Christianity. If you're just obeying the Lord, it's not that you've arrived on some plane. That's where it starts. If they're obedient, God will keep them healthy and prevent their suffering. It's not like they're playing me. But it's not possible for them. Look over, let's go on just a little bit further to chapter 16. The whole Israelite community set out for Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. 15th day of the second month after they came out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So they're complaining again. And the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and I ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Well, number one, Moses didn't bring them out of the assembly. God did. If they want to point a finger inside, they point at God and deal with him. So, so God has delivered them from slavery. He has split the sea at this point. He's changed the water to drinkable. And he's promised them a life without disease. And now it says that the people began to to grow. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm a little slow, but, but it says that they've been set free. They were thirsty. He gave them water. And, and, and I thought he had promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. You would think they would be hopeful. I mean, if I've been in slavery, everything's got to be better than slavery. You would think. Uh, you, you'd think they'd be grateful. Oh, man, God, can you believe? I mean, I've never seen water part and just completely walk across on dry land. Maybe that's normal for them. But if I've seen it, I'm going, God had to have been here somewhere. I've never seen water that was undrinkable at one moment, throw a piece of wood in it, and then you can drink it, and it's fine, and everybody's doing good. I've never seen a God promise, say, hey, I'm going to set you free from all disease if you'll just listen to me. But now the Israelites, what's so bad about it is they want to go back to slavery, slavery simply because obedience is too difficult. That's shocking. But yet I know we're the same way. And it's just too difficult. The pattern of doubt and complaint would follow them all the way to the point that they are standing on the outside of the promised land. The Israelites, the promised this land with milk and honey, they actually send spies in and prove that it existed. Remember, they said that the two men carried the cluster of grapes out. They had to put it on one thing and throw it down to the ground. Can you imagine one cluster of grapes? If that's one cluster of grapes, wherever they got those from had to be some side to be home. I mean, how big are the grapes? Are they big as your fist? I mean, if it's laying in clusters like that, how, how big is this thing? And you would think, they've seen, they've seen that the land will produce the fruit that God says for them to expect, but yet they do not want to go in. Why? Because there are giants in the land. There's giants. But God said he'd give to you. Yeah, God, there's giants. But God said he'd give to you. Yeah, God, but there's, there's giants over there. Have you seen them? And yet, when it gets tough, they would rather have the scraps of Egypt and choose to forget the hard labor to feed you than to battle for their blessing. This is what I know. A lot of us claim we want God to work in our lives. Oh, God, he's working in our lives. But we don't want to work in our own lives. We want the Jesus life. We do. Just give it to me, God. Do, this, do this, I'll give it to you. No, Lord, I don't want to do that. I'm sick. Just give it to me, God. No, Lord, I don't really want to serve. I ain't too big on volunteering. I ain't too big about going out and telling anybody about you. I just really want to come sit on my chair every Sunday. And you, just, you just bring the blessings on God. Just, I just want the Jesus lottery. Let me tell you something. When you work a garden, how many of you got a garden? You got a garden? Can you buy two of you, three of you, one or two plants? That's a garden. All right. I got a few plants, but that ain't nothing to write your grandma a letter about. But, but uh, you know, a garden. When you get, when you grab a garden, you get the fruits of your labor. You, know, you get to go out there, pick stuff, eat it. It's, it's awesome, you know, because you have to pay for it. Number one, and then you you you, you can feed it, and, and, and you can work it. But you know what? You can't make it grow. You feed, you work it, you can't make it grow. And not while you're sleeping, that garden's growing. And you can try, you can try all the things they tell you. You can look at that farmer's almanac. You can plant it on certain days, not plant it. And I think that really does make a difference somehow. When you're, I had one did good, one did, and I guess it all makes a difference. But you can't make it grow. But the benefits 
There's benefits to working the garden. What happens? Well, you get callous hands. Man hands, as I call them. And you learn the nature of the plant, and you learn the condition of the soil. And see, you don't learn that when you buy them at the store. You don't even know what to look for. But see, sometimes there are more lessons to be learned in the journey than there are in the blessing alone. And I think that's what God is trying to teach Israel. There, there's giants over there. But you need to go in there and defeat them. It's going to see, because right now you're thinking like a slave, and I want you not to think like that anymore. And you need to get a couple of victories under your belt if you want to start thinking the way that I want you, because I want you to reestablish your people. Y'all have been in slavery for too long. See, God wanted the Israelites to clear the land of its enemies, and what's great is he promised them a victory, and it all comes down to this, is it, do you believe when God promises you something that it'll come true? Even if it doesn't look favorable. I've been many times where I was like, don't know how you're going to do that. And, and just feel it. He's going to do 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 it. And go, don't really see how that will happen. Because I don't know how I'm going to get another job that I've just lost my job. I make more money over here. They, they pay me more because it's in California. Lord, I, I don't think anybody around here pays for what I do. They pay for the rate that I was getting. And they go, I don't know how it's going to happen. And they go, boom, there it is. You've got to believe what God has promised. See, the Israelites looked at their enemies, and this is what they did. They started questioning God. Oh, we can't beat them. We're, like, we're just like flies over there. Yet it was the hand of their enemies that cultivated the blessing that was waiting on them. Someone was working that land before they arrived. Do you realize if there would have been nobody in the promised land, then grapes would have been there. Why? Because there wouldn't have been nobody to take care of it. That farmland, it would have been worked a few years to get it ready to start producing a crop. But when they got there, that farmland was ready to go. It was already producing. It was already produced. There was somebody there cutting the grass. There was somebody there tending to the animals and the sheep and the things that were there. The things that they were going to inherit when they took over the enemy. They didn't have to go out and capture those animals. Those animals were already in pens. They were already in fences. There was people already there. There was buildings already built. All they had to go in and do is take care of what God said. Kill the giants. You got my favor. I'm going to do it for you. Just go do it. And when they would have done it, they would have walked into a place that was fully furnished. Israel complained about the presence of the giants, but the giants unknowingly were preparing the blessing for Israel. Yet Israel would rather seek shelter in slavery than battle for blessing that they had been promised they would win. We are going to battle for the blessing. If you're going to battle for the blessing, you're going to have to quit glaring at the giants. At the church here, we thought in January... When the elders met, we had about $60,000 debt. And I mean, that looks like a lot. I mean, it just is. It's, it's a lot of money. And we were like, man, that's, that's a lot of money, but let's, let's start hacking away at it. Let's start, let's start figuring out a way. Let's, you know, we've got so much that we have to have in case we have an insurance claim. We've got so much as an operational budget. But anything above that number, let's start just adding to the payment. Let's see how long it takes. Let's see how it Within five months, completely paid off, completely. Yet it, 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 just, it just crumbled when we attacked it. See, when we approach it in the natural, God begins to move in the supernatural. Why, why would we seek the familiarity of, for, of our former slavery in our life of sin outside of the promise and the favor of God when the Bible clearly says this? He says, so if the Son has set you free, then you're free indeed. You know what? I don't want to be chained down my past. I want to walk in the freedom that Christ has. Why are we accepting less when God's promised us more? Sin cannot be our place of comfort that we return to. If you're in bondage to anything today, you're not free to anything. If you're in bondage to anything, whether it be addiction, whether it be negative thoughts, whether it be uh, bad relationships, if you're in bondage to anything, then you're not free of anything. Look here, Jesus answered them. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to it. You know what a slave is? It says if you're a slave to something, that means that what? It rules over you. It dictates where you come and where you go. You operate under its will and for its pleasure and its profit. Israel is a great example of this. Why is it a great? Because they're not profiting. Uh, they're not profiting their own success. They are profiting for the success of Egypt. They don't choose when they come and go. They simply do as they're told. And then what I love about it is that God hears their cries and he comes and sets them free. And what's interesting is that they allow the hardship of today to keep them from the promise of tomorrow. They would rather have food than freedom. You know how messed up that is? I'd hate to know that I made all of my decisions about my future based on how I feel right now. Lord, I just need food for today. I don't care about tomorrow. Just feed me. Uh, Lord, I see why. What are you going to do? Are you going to do that already? I don't care. I don't care. They, they make their 
decisions based on today. They have no vision of the future because they can't see past their current need. It would be like this. Imagine right now we're over here graduating. Some of you may have, have, have done this. But a, a, imagine a teenager is given a scholarship. Okay? And it's a scholarship that includes if they want to go to medical school, if they want to go to veterinary school, whatever they want to do. That somebody has said, hey, I will write the check. I will make it happen. And they have the opportunity to go wherever they want to go, their future's bright, all they have to do is invest however many years it takes to complete that degree. And all of us people who, who are older now, we would say, man, that would be a good deal. That would be awesome, because I know I pay a lot of students, I'm not doing that, it's really good. But imagine that the, that the teenager looks and says, you know what, I'm just burn out on school, I don't think I'm going to do that, I'm just burn out. And, and so they would choose how they fill the day to dictate where they will be in the future. See, if they follow it out, if they school, they're going to walk away debt-free making $250,000, $300,000 a year. But yet they can't see that because they're so concerned about how they feel today. And that's what the Israelites are doing. They're like, oh, today we feel like this, so we would rather go back to slavery than walk into the promised land that you've got for us, God. Anytime that we choose comfort of today at the cost of the promise of tomorrow, we settle for less than what God has for us. Look at this quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desire not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is, what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. We can't see that God has more for us, so we settle for our mud pies in the slum than a holiday vacation on a boat at sea. Jesus tells us this in John 10, 10. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I come that they may have life and have it to the full. In other words, when we live for him, we can get life the way that it was expected to. The Israelites show us this because when the journey heats up, the weak surrender. It's always that way. It's always that way. I don't know if you ever played on a ball team. I played ball growing up, football. There were guys on our team who were weak. And as soon as we started running, they would just lay out. I remember being in the fire academy. And the first day, they said, one of the first days, they said, hey, we're going to put on all our gear, and we're going to go on a march through town. And I'm like, okay. I'm like 20, 20 years old at the time, I guess. And I'm, so I'm like, I'm not full of bigger, you know. I weigh 100 and nothing pounds. And, and I put all this gear on this backpack. And I, you know what I said to myself when they said we're going to go for a walk? I said, I'm going to put my thumbs under my back, under my pack right here, and I'm just going to keep walking until it's over with. That was just the way I was determined. I was like, I don't care where we go. I don't care what we do. And I remember we let out, and we hadn't walked even a mile yet, and we turned a corner, and there was a hill going up like this. And this guy that was with us, he started dry heaving. I'm like, we ain't even walked the hill yet. But see, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, fathom where we were going to go from there. So he started driving. The next thing I know, like a mile later, he passed out in a ditch somewhere. We have to have somebody come pick him up. Why? Because he was so consumed. He was weak, and so he surrendered. It's very easy to give up. It may actually, it, uh, initially it may cost you nothing. But eventually, it will take everything you have. They start forgetting what the chains felt like. They forget their master's whips. And they forget the sound of their commands. There was a song, and I've often reminded of it in times of difficulty when I'm looking back, thinking, well, maybe that job was better than this job, or maybe that time was better than this time. And it said this. It says, I've been painting pictures of Egypt, but I'm leaving out what remains. The future feels so hard, and I just want to go back. So we paint these pictures in our mind of, of that the other times in our life were better, that they were far more productive. But we leave out the things that it lacks. I think we get so comfortable with the idea of living in the past because if we embrace the future, we might have to slay a few giants and walk around a few walls. You don't get handed to you. You know, if you want a good marriage, you don't get handed to you. You have to work at it. But then the fruits of your labor are worth the work. See, the beauty of the promised land is there are walled cities there, yes, but the faithful and obedient are going to see them fall. And what's great about it is what lies on the other side of the walls is the inheritance for the children of God. There's, a, there's quite a lesson when the children of Israel surrender to Jericho. I want you to think about this. This is the way it works. 
There's a wall around the city of Jericho. But God starts off and he tells them that the city is going to be there. Let me show you. Joshua chapter 6. Now the gates of Jericho were, secure, were securely barred because of the Israelites. So in other words, they had heard that the Israelites were around. And they started typing things up. And no one went out and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I deliver Jericho in your hand, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all our men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. And then the wall of the city will collapse. So the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up with everyone straight in. Everyone's fixing to go in. That tells me this about the walls of the city, is that everything in the city belonged to them before they had ever laid eyes on them. Much like the promises that God's made to us, it's this, they, they belong to us now. But we may need to walk around the walls a few more times before we take over. You've probably got things that you prayed about, things that you're hoping for, things that you're excited about, things that you say, oh Lord, I don't even feel like in your heart, you know, one day I'm gonna have those things. But it's, it's difficult to live every day when you can't see. It's difficult to live every day when you can't hold it. When it hasn't happened yet. When you've been praying for years and it hasn't happened yet. It's hard to hold on to that promise. But you've got to look at it like this. I may have to walk around these walls a few more times unknowing of what's inside in order for these walls to fall. The, the other thing that this tells me is this. Is sometimes you have to walk in faith before you can walk in victory. The Israelites were to get up and they were to walk. They were trusting that God was going to deliver the city to them. I wonder if the guards set up on the walls of Jericho and bought them. You know, they were up there. That, that city had been there for a long time. I'm sure there had been multiple armies that had advanced Jericho but couldn't get past the walls. They were pretty impressive, you know. You know they they rushed up to the top and they thought, That's, I mean, they'll never get in here. The gates are locked. We're, we're, we're not worried. We're standing up here. We're up here. They're down there. They don't have cannons. They don't have catapults. They don't have men shooting bows and arrows. They're just simply walking. How dumb must the Israelites be? And you know, when I think about that, I think about it's much like us. We have things that we're, we're walking in faith, believing God to do, and we have people mocking us, telling us, you're never going to do that again. You'll never be successful there. You'll never amount to nothing. You'll never be able to do that. And the whole time, what is your job to do? Walk faithfully. Walk obedient. Listen to the Lord. Just keep pressing forward. You know, people will tell us we were never meant to, or we were never about to anything. People will discourage us and mock us every time that we slip on our journey. But the lesson that we need to learn is that God is walking below, is working below the surface. This is what I know. All right, this is what I believe. I, I won't say this is what I know for sure, but this is what I believe. I believe this. I believe as they walked, and as they walked around those walls, boom, 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 one day after the next, boom, 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 it didn't crumble the foundation of those walls. The pressure of them walking around those walls was working below the surface, and those, those uh, mortar foundations began to crumble. Did the Israelites know they didn't? They just walk. Boom, 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 boom. I'm faithful. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to do what God says. God's going to deliver us. Because think about it. Think about their, 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 the way that they were going to war against them. He says, walk around the wall. Then the last day, walk around a bunch of times. And then when you hear the long blast, the trumpet yell, what happens when you yell? Well, think about an opera singer when they sing a high note and the glass shatters. He said, yell. Their voice brought the walls down. Why? Because they're walking weak in the foundations. And that's what we do. We walk around faithfully, believing that as we walk, God is tearing down the things that we can't see. He's working behind a canvas that he's going to drop and reveal. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been standing there, and then all of a sudden I get a phone call, and it's like the canvas just dropped, and I can see all this stuff that God's been working out that I had no idea he was working on. He's working below the surface. The weight of their walk weakened the foundation of the walls. The walls in your life are 
simply whatever is standing in between you and the promises of God. So when we advance or move forward in obedience and faith, we're saying by our actions that we believe that we're going to inherit the promises of God. Can I see them? No. They lay on the other side of the city. Does that mean that they don't exist? Not at all. Not at all. I can't see China, but I'm pretty sure it's there today. But to turn around and embrace the thought, just the thought of slavery, better than what God has promised is not only sad, it has to be offensive. God has come and set them free. And you know what? For us to do it is even worse because Jesus has come set them free. And a God that would pay for our freedom at the price of his son doesn't deserve for me to give a second look at what you should do. I need to give a second. And it all comes down to comfort. The Israelites went the promised land, but not at the cost of their comfort. How many things do you do uh, for comfort. Think about the vehicle that you drive. Probably most of us, we drive it for comfort. It was like, hey, this is nice. It's getting, yeah, okay. It goes down the road. It's got air conditioning. That's a win. You know? Uh, it's got four wheels instead of three. This is good. Um, and, and you ride it, and it's comfortable. Think about your living room. It's probably got a recliner in it or a nice sofa, you know, in your, your bed. Oh, you're like, oh, I can't wait to sleep in my bed because my bed is so much greater than every other bed on earth. And you're like, you just can't wait to get there. Oh, my home's better than it's, it's, it's for comfort, right? In your life right now, though, what are you retreating to that God has set you free from simply because you cannot handle the journey to the promised land? God was able to bring Israel out of slavery, but the people would not allow him to bring slavery out of them. So as long as you think like a slave, you'd be a slave. As long as you, you have that mentality, you can't walk forward in victory if you're always thinking about defeat. I'm telling you, I use sports a lot because I really relate to it, but if you go out there thinking you're going to lose, guess what? You're going to lose. If you go out there and the whole team thinks they're going to lose, you're definitely going to lose. And you're probably going to take quite the beating. But I've seen teams that weren't near as good, weren't near as talented, shouldn't have been winning, win ball games. I've seen them do things that I didn't think they could do. I've seen kids play harder than they've ever played before at certain times because somebody believed in them and told them that they could. And God was able to bring Israel out of slavery, but he couldn't bring slavery out of them. See, sometimes the hardest thing is not changing your direction. Sometimes the hardest thing is to change your mind. Oh, I've always done it this way. Has it worked for you? I've always done this. It's the way we've always done it. Well, is it working? No. Then why don't we change it? See, I see this often when someone comes to me and they, they have a destructive relationship. They would rather stay in abuse than journey to promise. So they make excuses for their actions and the actions of their mate because the journey to freedom is not always easy. And these relationships don't always have to end, but they do have to change. They can't keep being the same way. And in every journey, there's an enemy and there is a wall. But when we surrender to the Lord, guess what? Our enemies surrender to us. But that's the process. It's got to go to the Lord, and then it's got to go to us. We know we can't go directly to our enemies, but when we submit to the Lord, He comes to us. God wants us to come out of slavery, and He wants to set us free. Look here, Galatians 5 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. See, whatever you submit to is what will become your master. We can't go back to comfortable. We must continue to seek out God's plan. And I found this. I found. When I seek in the hardest, there's going to be giants, but there's going to be giant victories. If you want to win in life, you're going to face giants, but you're going to face giant victories. In our Christian walk, it's easy to start off like, oh man, I love this thought. I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. I love this thought. Let me know what pioneer is. A pioneer. A pioneer goes out, and they take new land. And they conquer new ground. And people told me a long time, they said, you got a pioneering spirit, man. You like to go out. And I love that. It's like, you want to go out. You want to take new land. You want to go cut down paths, create roads, create homes. Get, you, know, get, you know, capture the animals and make them submit to your fences. You want to go out there and do things that have never been done before. Think about when they, when they started going west in America. And they started conquering all this land. And then eventually it would lead to a railroad that crosses the entire 
used to call one time at church all week. We go from pioneers to settlers. I'm just going to camp out here and get Oh, I was fired up, man. I was ready to take on the whole world. I, I, I don't go anywhere. And now I do a good time, a good time to me for an hour and a half a week. They turn, they turn around and become settlers, and we tend to get comfortable and then camp out, and we no longer conquer new territory. Our decision, though, to settle not only impacts us, but it impacts others. We often choose to live in slavery when actually we're called more than just to be free. We're called to set others free. Look here. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from dark and the release from darkness for the prisoners. God has called you to set others free. As Christians, if we're not here to set people free through the gospel, what hope is there for a lost and dying world? Because you can't set people free if you still look at yourself as a slave. The Israelites, they witnessed miracles of God. He had fed them with their own hand. He had shown them his glory, yet they still chose slavery over freedom. So I had a couple of questions, and I'm done. Are you free today? Are you still carrying the label of the past? Do you think of just staying where you are and going back to your old lifestyle? Because God is already preparing your promised land. And it will open up to you when you become the obedient father. Randy, would you come this morning? Well, this is the world day. What I'm challenging you to do is to get free and to live in God wants more for you. But if you're a slave to anything, then you're not free to anything. And God wants more for your life. He wants more for your family. So he wants you to get out of that settler mentality and go back to being a pioneer. Let's stand together. The altar is open today. And it's simply this. It's just like, God, how can I be free in you so that I can accomplish as much as you want me to accomplish in this life that you've given me? I want to run to the finish and I want to embrace what you have for me. So if, that, if you're in need today and you say, God, I'm just struggling with some things. I, I, I'm just a slave to addiction. I'm a slave to relationships. I'm a slave to all these other things, fear, doubt, all of them. Then ask God to come, come and ask God to set you free.